um, friends of yours, um, people that you know that don't know Christ. Um, honestly, I hope that through it all that you're able to share. Um, but in, invite them to come. And as I've thought about what this revival is talking about, what we're basically saying is there, um, there, there was a, a news, uh, not a news, uh, um, an advertisement that has been playing on, on television um, talking about Jesus and Jesus understands. Uh, can someone remember? What, what's that called? He gets us. And the point of that, those advertisements, whether it's good or bad or whatever, the point that they're trying to make is you ought to at least consider who Jesus is. And um, when we look at the last thing that Jesus had to say on the cross, we have an understanding to who to understand who he is, not in necessarily trying to turn him into who we are, but to understand what he says about who he is. So um, let's begin this morning with a, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be able to worship your name. Thank you that you have shown us who you are. You've revealed yourself through your word. You've told us how you want us to live and how we can please you. And you love us. You love us so much that you died for us. And as we celebrate this morning and as we sing, I pray that we would sing with our hearts and with our minds. Um, that you would be exalted. Bless those that can't be there, be here this morning. Pray for those that are sick and traveling. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would move in a mighty way, that you would redeem your people. And help us to be diligent to do the work that you've called us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'd like to invite anybody who want to come and sing in the choir. There's plenty of room up here. Just come on up.
Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer and he'll receive the offering. Tanner, do you want to lead us? Lord bless it. I pray for Mr. Matt as he preaches to us today that you would give him the words to speak. I pray. Thank you for everything that you give to us. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Christ the true and better Adam, Son of God and Son of Man, who when tempted in the garden never yielded, never sinned, He who makes the many righteous brings us back to life again. Dying he reversed the curse, then rising crushed the serpent's head. Christ the true and better Isaac, humble son of sacrifice, who would climb the fearful mountain there to offer up his life laid with faith upon the altar father's joy and only son their salvation was provided oh what full and boundless love amen Christ the story is the glory. Alleluia. Amen. Christ the true and better Moses called to lead a people home. Standing bold to earthly powers, God's great glory to be known. With his arms stretched wide to heaven, see the waters part in two. See the veil is torn forever, cleansed with blood we pass now through.
Christ the true and better David, lowly shepherd, mighty king, he the champion in the battle, where, O oh, death, is now thy sting. In our place he bled and conquered, crown him Lord of majesty. He shall be the throne forever, we shall heir his people be. Amen, amen, from beginning to end. Christ the story is the glory, alleluia, amen. His shall be the throne forever, we shall heir his people be. Turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6. This is a part three as we look at families. Um, first thing we talked about was wives, a message to the wives, and then a message um, to husbands. And now, as we continue, we're, we're going to con consider children and fathers. That will be the, the two, um, two, people, two groups of people that are um, addressed this morning. I want to begin with reading the scripture, and then I want to make an observation, and then we'll, we'll look at the specific commands that um, Paul gives us here in Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, there's a point that I want to make before we even look at the, the specific commands to children and to fathers. And the point is this, that if you look through these verses, beginning in, in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 22, what you'll notice is that God is at the heart of the Christian home. Let me say it to you this way. In verse 22, we're told, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The point is the Lord. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The point is, as Christ loved the church. And now, children, on, obey your parents in the Lord. That's how you're supposed to obey them. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The instruction of the Lord. And so you notice that the Lord is in the heart of all four of these commands. So that's a good place to start. Christian homes ought to have God in the heart of them. Now, what I want to do this morning is, is really break down these, these two commands that we get to children and then to take a look at some of the things that are said to parents. The first of the commands is, children, obey your parents. Raise your hand this morning if you're a child. Some of the adults said, raise your hand if you have parents, living or dead, but everyone here has parents to some degree, Right? Okay, so I, I want to make a point here about obedience, that what we're being told here is, children, you are supposed to obey your parents. The first thing I want to tell you about obedience, obedience is a decision. It's a choice that you make. You choose to obey. This does not say obey your parents when you, ought, when, when you want to. That's not obedience. There's a, there's a joke about training a dog, if you, if, if you, um, I can make any dog come to me, give me a little piece of meat, and I'm pretty sure I can make any dog come to me. The real trick of dog training 
is when the dog doesn't come when you have the piece of meat, <laughs> right? When the dog sits when it doesn't want to sit and stay when it doesn't want to stay. And that's obedience. That's what obedience looks like. And the same thing is true in, in children. So children, if you think that what obey your parents mean is just to do what, you, what they want you to when you want to do it, that's not obedience at all. That's just you happen to be walking the same direction. Obedience is a decision that you make. Secondly, obedience is an external action. What that means is it's something that's done on the outside. There's a story of a little boy that was standing up and his father told him to sit. And he continued to stand up and his father said, if you don't sit down, son, I'm going to give you a spanking. And so the boy sat down, crossed his arms over his chest and said, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. What does that show? It shows not disobedience. They were still, he was still obeying, but he was only obeying on the outside. Now, this is somewhat of an encouragement. Kids, the right thing to do is to obey even if you don't want to. Even if you, now, we'll get to the heart in a minute. I'm not saying it's, wrong. it's okay for your heart to be wrong, but it is a starting point. And all of us, when we choose to obey the Lord, there are times in our lives that the obedience stretches beyond what we feel like doing. I don't know about y'all, just an honest confession. I would not read my Bible every morning if it was up to me. There are some mornings that I get up and I choose to do it because I want to be obedient. Now, once I start reading, I'm glad I did. Looking back at it, I'm thrilled that the Lord has allowed me to do that. But do you understand that there's sometimes there's an external action that needs to happen, and then the internal will follow from that. So obedience is an external action. And then Paul not only tells children you need to obey your parents, but he also gives us a little bit of reasoning why. Now, this is nice. As a, as a son, my father often told me, well, what do you expect? The father says, do this. What's the, what's the question? Why? Why do I have to do this? And what's the answer to that question? Because I said so, right? And there is a point to that in which that's true. You obey because your father said so. But Paul's really kind to us here, and he tells children, this is why you need to obey. Why? Look there. You tell me. Why should you obey? Because this is right. It's the right thing to do to obey your parents. Now, this is an easy command. Matter of fact, this is one of those verses that a lot of children... I memorized this when I was very young. <laughs> this seems to be way up there on the list of verses that children should memorize, and for good reason. This is a passage of Scripture that is directly written to children. So children, pay attention to it. But I want to give you an example. This, is, this becomes, for those of us that are older and have thought through this, I've had a lot of people ask me questions. Well, at what age do I quit obeying? How long do I have to do this? Is this for life? I'm 40-something years old. If my father were to call me right now and ask me to do something, do I obey him in the Lord for this is right? When does that? What, what's the transition? Well, what if they ask me to do something that's immoral? Is that in the Lord? So where, where's the line? And so as easy as a command as this is and as straightforward as it looks, mm, the longer we think about it, it's not. So what I want to do is I want to show you all an example. So hold your place here because we're going to come back to Ephesians chapter 6. But if you will turn with me to Luke chapter 2. And I think that it'll show you something that is shocking to us in the West, and yet at the same time helpful. How many of y'all know what a bar mitzvah is? What is it, what, how old do you have to be to go to a bar mitzvah? 13? Okay, and what is it a sign of? Okay. Manhood, becoming an adult. All right, well, let's, let's look at Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading in verse 41. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. What we read here is a 12-year-old boy who, according to Jewish tradition, had become a man. What do you see Jesus doing as he became a man? Well, there's a couple of things. There's an independence. We know that Jesus went up to the temple every year. So why was it at the age of 12 that he stayed? Why didn't he stay at 11 or 10 or 6 or 4? What, what was it about this 12th year that made him decide to stay? And my understanding is According to the Jewish people, this is when he became a man. This was the sign of now that he understood, now that he was recognized as being a man, he must be about his father's business and do what he needed to do. Now, there's this whole story about him being gone for three days. Can you imagine the worry and concern that his parents would have? What had happened to him? The entire nation of Israel was supposed to be appearing into Jerusalem. At that time, it was full of people, hard to find. But there's another aspect to this that I think is important. So children, you might say to yourself, well, as soon as I'm 12, guess what, parents, <laughs> it's time. And you know what? If you want to pay the light bill and, and all the other things that are coming, we, we can talk about being an adult. That, that's good. Um, but in all seriousness, there's something else that we see. What happened? How does this story end? With Jesus, it specifically says that Jesus submitted to them. Even in Jesus doing this independent thing that now that he is an adult, he is allowed to do, he shows that he defers to doing to what his parents asked him to do. Does it make sense? And so for kids and for you older kids, I think this is helpful for us. When it's possible, obey your parents. And it's not like there's this line that appears when I become, in America, we probably would have set the line somewhere between 18 and 21 and maybe now 26. It seems like it's pushing back further and further that we're going to say, okay, you're an adult. But there's not a fast line. There's never been a hard and fast line. Some people are children for longer than others. <laughs> what does it look like? Well, as Christians, there is a principle that it is right to obey your parents. Now, it does say in the Lord, obe children, uh, the, the word obedience has an object. That means you obey someone, and the someone is your parents, and specifically in the Lord. So children, obey your parents. Now, the second one is actually the harder of the two commandments. Jana told me I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to. So buckle up. <laughs> Let's keep reading. Chapter 6, verse 2. Honor your father and mother. So children, what's the next command? Honor your parents. Now, honor is also a decision. Just like obedience is a decision, honor is a decision. It is a choice that you make. But the difference between obedience and honor is obedience is an external decision, and honor is an internal decision. It's an internal action. 
In other words, what it means that I honor my father and my mother is something that happens inside, in my heart. Now, how that works out is it plays out into my obedience and the things that I do. But now, see, what I was telling you before, that kids, if you don't want to obey, do it anyway. That there's an external action that begins, but if you will obey them externally and if you'll seek the Lord in this, what needs to happen is following underneath it is that you learn to honor, to esteem your parents. Now, Paul, again, helps us and tells us why. Well, why should you obey? Because it's the right thing to do. Why should you honor your parents? Well, he tells us that there's a promise that was given. This is... One of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandment, it's the fifth, it's the first Ten Commandment, uh, having to do with relationships with people. And he says in it, to honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now, when I was a kid and I read this verse, I was a little confused. Does that mean if you honor your parents, you live a long life? Does it mean that anytime we see someone who's over the age of 90, that's a good sign that they probably honored their parents? No. Well, what was, Paul, what was Moses, actually what was God talking about when he gave the Ten Commandments to the people? You would live long in the land? Means that you would be able to stay in the promised land for a long time. Well, the people didn't stay. Why didn't they stay? Because they sinned against God and they forgot Him. And so there's actually two parts of this. The first half of this, so honoring your parents has benefits. That's why we do it. And the benefits are both now, that's the first part of, of this, that it may go well with you. Okay? You don't have to turn there, but in Proverbs chapter 6, there's a lot of places about parenting, by the way, in Proverbs. If you're a young parent or about to be a young parent, I would highly recommend studying the book of Proverbs and just looking at the parenting portion of that scripture. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When, they, when you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Hear what he's saying. If you will listen to your parents, they will help you now. When Jan and I met, we met doing missions in Memphis. And um, for one year, I was on staff as a summer missionary. And so every Sunday, we would get middle schoolers and sometimes high schoolers that would come and their job, middle schoolers and high schoolers, their job was to lead some younger kids, elementary school age, in Bible clubs. And they were to do that in the projects, in different places, different low, low income locations in, around the city of Memphis. And one of the things I always stress to those kids is when we go out there, if you hear me tell you to do something, don't ask me why. I'll be happy to explain to you later, but we don't have time for that. So if I tell you, all right, everybody, let's go get in the car and go home, you stop playing tags, you pick up your stuff, we're going. And I'll tell you later that there are things you don't see that I do see and things you don't know about that I'm going to know about, and I don't have time to tell you all those things to keep you safe. So you just need to listen. In the same way, kids, when your parents tell you to do things, Honor what they're telling you, and it'll help your life be so much better. They will instruct you along the way, and just like Proverbs tells you, it'll be like a light in a dark place. You'll be able to go in places you wouldn't be able to go if you'll just listen to your parents and do what they say. Now, I gave you an example of Jesus in obedience, and now I want to give you a little bit of an illustration about this honoring your parents. So um, I've told some of the kids, but I want my kids to come up here and bring your, bring your uh, um, blindfolds. So you've, you have those. I'll try to do this quickly. I want you to line up in birth order. Okay, let's, we'll line up right here across here in birth order. And uh, go ahead and blindfold yourself. 
I was trying to think about how to get this point across. So yeah, if you'll stand about right here this way, go ahead and blindfold yourself. Come on, there you go. Wait till you get up the stairs. There you go. <laughs> All right, so here's what I want to do for y'all. I want you to imagine generations, and we don't have this number of generations in here, so I'm going to help you, okay, and y'all help me along the way, and uh, those of you, I, I'm using a specific line, so if we start with, we'll say Lydia represents Abraham, Abraham had a son, who was Abraham's son? Isaac, okay, so this is Isaac, okay, Isaac had a son who was Isaac's son, Jacob, he had others as well, but Jacob is who we'll talk about, okay, Jacob had 12 um, we'll take Judah, okay? So, so this is Judah, okay? So Judah would be, Judah's grandfather would be who? Abraham, Isaac, good, all right. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. Judah had a son, Perez, okay? And Perez had a son, Hebron. And we could go on and we can go on and we can go on, okay? Already, we're working through this. Um, now, here's what honoring your family. This is why in the Ten Commandments it said, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. This is what it's talking about. When you honor your parents, it's kind of like, Kyla, put your arms, put your hands on Lydia's shoulder. It's kind of, there you go. Kind of like looking at and remembering what they taught. Okay? So Alana, do the same thing. So this would be like Jacob, honoring Isaac, okay, and this would be like Judah, good, I've done a good job, <laughs> this is a good sign of obedience, right, I tell them to blindfold themselves, and they're blindfold, okay, and then Perez, honoring Judah, and now Hebron, okay, honoring Okay, so this is what it looks like. So now, at the very beginning, when God made promises, all right, Lydia, put your hands out. I'm going to grab your hands. When God made promises to Abraham, he told Abraham, you're to be my person, you're to be mine, you're to live for me. I'm making promises to you. And so he began directing Abraham how to walk. And if Abraham walks the way he's supposed to walk, and his children honors him, and their children honor them, and that continues, do you see what happens? Now, kids, if you'll stay right here, <clears throat> what do you think will happen if little Hebron decides, you know what, I don't think I want to honor my parents anymore? What if you, I, I'm just going to live my own way, I'm going to do my own thing. What do you think that will, that's going to happen as they try to follow the Lord and get lost? So kids, and, and you guys can take off your blindfolds, and good job, thank you for doing that for me. When it talks about honoring your parents that you may live long in the land, this is what it's talking about. God made it a point to show us how to live. And if your parents love the Lord and are following the Lord, as you honor them, you are actually following the Lord through that. And it doesn't have the benefits go down. What would have happened if Jacob quit honoring well, it goes downstream, right? It's not just Jacob. It's also Jacob's son and his son and his son. And if you've been here on Wednesday night, we were talking about the Danites and all of their problems. That goes way back to problems that the fathers had. So this is an, a strong encouragement to you children that you need to honor your parents. But now we need to move on to talk about the parents the parents need to be the type of people to raise their children well. Now, there's a lot here, and I would it's already close to 12. We're going to go over a little bit, but we could talk for hours and hours and hours about raising children and what that looks like and how serious of business it is. And, and I'm just going to share with you, uh, you adults, a couple of points. And believe it or not, I'm actually going to start with you men because that's what Scripture does. The scripture here says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, fathers, bring up your children is the basic command here. And I, I want to make 
Five points, very quickly. The first point is fathers. You lead the discipline of your home. And this is one of the places I cannot count the number of times I've been around new couples and little little Johnny does something he's not supposed to do. The father recognizes it, begins to step in, and what happens? The mother runs and tries to protect little Johnny from father. Women, wives, mothers, don't do that. You need to have a conversation. If he's not doing it the way that you think he ought to, y'all have that conversation. But fathers are given the command in Scripture. This does not say mothers and fathers bring up your children. It says fathers bring up your children. And there is a, there's a reason for that. The reason for that is fathers, you are to be the leader in your home. And that means it is your responsibility to help raise your children, to raise your children. Women, it comes naturally. You want to nurture. You want to care. You want to be part of the family. Men, some of you have to be told, you know what, you need to go pick up your son and do something with him. You need to have a tea party with your daughter. <laughs> or whatever, whatever it is that looks like. But fathers, you are not allowed to be absent in the raising of your children. That is not the scriptural mandate. It is right here. Fathers, bring up your children. Secondly, there's a balance here. You need to be careful not to provoke. The word that comes to my mind is meekness. When I think of what a father needs to look like with his children, the word meek is a good word because what it shows is power that is under control. And so, yes, as fathers, you have the role to be the disciplinarian, the one who is responsible for correction and all of those things. But the scripture specifically tells us, but be careful not to provoke them to anger. This is to be done lovingly and carefully. And men, we have a tendency to be harsh. And so it needs to be corrected and say, you know what? You need to care about how the child hears what it is you're saying. The book of Colossians, Paul says it this way, that the children are not discouraged. You don't want to provoke them to anger and you don't want to break their spirit. You don't want to discourage them. And that's hard to do. That balance of, of holding things strong and at the same time holding things lovingly and carefully is tough. Be careful not to provoke. Thirdly, bring them up. And probably if you're filling out the bulletin, you probably could guess what that word was supposed to be. My point is, the point of parenting is for children to be raised. Some people enjoy the process of parenting, and it is fun. But somehow they don't really want their children to ever be grown. <laughs> That's not the goal. The goal of parenting is to be a temporary thing. So when we're talking to the children, how long should you obey? Well, as long as I have parents, sure. I should show them respect and honor. I should obey them if I can. And yet at the same time, fathers and mothers, there comes a time where you need to not be giving, that they need to be raised. I'm praying very hard that when my children are 30, they don't need me to obey anymore. They don't have to call me and say, well, I was, I was wondering if I could stay out tonight for a little bit later. Like, as a 30-year-old, I hope we're past that. Because I hope that, they, that whatever went into my decision-making process, they've now learned and they've become adults. The point of raising children is for them to be raised. There is a conclusion, and they become adults. So bring them up. And then there's two things that he says. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction is what ESV says. If you're reading King James or New King James, it probably says, bring them up in the nourishment and admonition of the Lord. Let me explain those two words. The first word has to do with action. It's something you physically do. And so there is a corrective aspect to that. If I'm disciplining my children... It doesn't just mean that I'm giving them a spanking. I'm helping them learn to be disciplined. That's what it means. And how do I do that? Well, I have to 
physically correct. When they're learning to walk, this means holding their fingers, physically holding their fingers, keeping them balanced. When it talks about how they're supposed to be living their life, it's the physical part of helping them understand. This is what it means to get. This is how you get dressed. This is how you walk. This is what happens when you don't do what I tell you. And all of those things, it's training by action, which, by the way, is as much by example action as it is by practiced action. Does that make sense? Nourishing and disciplining your children also means they watch your disciplined life. How can you expect them to live a disciplined life if you don't live one? So the two of them go together, trained by action. But the second one, instruction or admonishment, it still recognizes that there's a correction. But now what we're talking about is training by word. So there is both training by action and training by word. And both of those need to be in the Lord. So what does that tell fathers? You had better be in the Lord. How can you train your children with discipline in the Lord if you don't know the Lord? How can you give instruction in the Lord if you don't know the Lord? So fathers, bring up your children. Now, again, this doesn't mean, obviously, no one thinks that fathers are going to be the only ones who ever see their children. That's not what this is talking about. I remember... One time that I had to take a child out of the service. And I've heard y'all talk. Y'all know what that means, right? I had to take them out of the service. We had to talk about. No, it wasn't. It was, it was discipline. It was trained by action. <laughs> and so that happened, and it, I, I do my best to go to a place where no one else can hear and that it can be a private conversation. Um, but there was someone who, who, who saw that, and they were really upset with me. I can't believe you would do that. And that's just, and just went on and on for about five minutes. They just berated me. I cannot believe you do such a thing. Now, the funny thing was, the, it was a girl that was doing it, and I think she might have been 14 or 15. So she's not even an adult herself, definitely doesn't have children. Like, part of me wanted to say, you'll just give it 10 years and come back and talk to me. But that's not what I said. What I told her was this. Like, look. For one thing, I know you don't love my child as much as I love my child. Because you're not willing to do for her what I'm willing to do for her. I know you don't. That's the first thing. But secondly, is you will not stand before God and answer for how you raised my daughter. I will. So while I appreciate your input, it's just input. And I will make the decision that I need to make because I am the one who will stand before God and answer. And fathers, you need to be told, according to Scripture, fathers are the ones who bring up their children. You will stand before God and answer for what you did with your children. And you need help? For me, Jana has been a world of help to come back and say, you know what? That might have been a little provoking. <laughs> um, or even to say, she's also called me the other way during the day. I don't know what to do. We call it being principal. Sometimes I have to be principal. She'll explain all the, this horrific thing that happened, and then she'll say, okay, I'm going to give them the phone. <laughs> and we have to have a conversation with the child, and I have to help Jana know that she's got backup that the things that are going on in home, at home, if it's not going the way that it needs to, that there's someone who's going to help it to go that way. So fathers, you need your, your wives to help you, but understand where the buck lies. And it's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. And if it goes well, what happens is what I showed you, this line. God says... In the Ten Commandments, he would punish the sins of the fathers on the children for the third and fourth generation, but he would show loving kindness to a thousand generations of those who love him. Think about that line. If you quit following, if you take your hands off and you no longer follow the Lord, it affects you and it affects your children and it affects your grandchildren and it affects your great-grandchildren. 
But if you keep following, if you'll honor the Lord, what God says is he would show loving kindness to a thousand generations, much longer than this string that I had up here this morning. And that's an encouragement. Now, I'll say this and then, and then we'll be finished. As we've looked at the family, and next week we'll be looking at what I think is a work relationship. We're going to talk about masters and bond servants. And I don't think anyone here has any slaves that work for them. I don't think. But I think of these verses, and I don't think anyone here is enslaved by another person in the way that you typically think, although many of us are in bondage. I do think that there is a point that we can learn from this from the scripture about how we relate to those that we work for and how we can relate to those who work for us. And so we'll consider that, the, the working aspect of life as a Christian. But this morning, just looking at what we've talked about as a family, I hope that it is absolutely under, overwhelming for you as a wife to understand what it means to submit to your husbands in the Lord. That is tough. And husbands, I hope that you understand it is absolutely overwhelming to love your wife the way Christ loved the church. That is not possible. And children, obeying your parents in the Lord in the good times, in the bad times, in easy times, and learning to honor them is tough. You need help. And fathers, to bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? What a high calling. And so I want to end this morning with a passage out of Hebrews. If you will, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. When we looked at wives, we recognized that they are serving as an example of the church. When we look at husbands, they are serving as an example of Christ. And when we look at the father-child relationship, it also has its root in who God is. Chapter 12, verse 3. Consider him, that's Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you, are to, that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subjects to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You might have been listening this morning and say, you know what, I, I will never be a father or a mother. I don't have any children. Or you might even be saying, my children are all raised. This is past, this would have been good to know 50 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever. But there's a point of this scripture that doesn't, that applies to all of us. And that is, God is a good father. God has given us both the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, fully lived out in Jesus. And we as his children, are to obey him and to honor him. So in a sense, all, every one of us is a child because we're the children of God. 
Now, the question is, are you an illegitimate child who has no father because you have not accepted his discipline and what he's doing? Or are you willing to be adopted, to be called a child of God? And that is the promise of salvation. You'd go from being the father of darkness and come in to be a child of the light. And that's the offer that Jesus has made for every one of us. And for those who have accepted that, the reason we walk in holiness is because we're obeying our Heavenly Father because He loves us as a good Father loves us. And when we go through hard times, we recognize that He disciplines us as every good Father does. And discipline by its nature is supposed to be painful. That's its point. It's corrective. But those who have been trained by it will walk like He wants us to walk and will please Him. Let's stand and sing a hymn of invitation. Number 281. finish this morning, let's, let's be dismissed with singing the family of God. And before we sing, isn't that a wonderful thought? We have a good father who loves us very much, who has taken us into our family. And uh, as we serve, isn't it wonderful to be part of the family of God? Let's be dismissed this morning. I'm